Barbarism of Civilization Mind Or Pandora, the First Robot Idol Peter D. Konev The reason for publishing these excerpts from my yet-to-be-published book, History of the Invisible, is the current processes of global barbarization of societies that we are witnessing especially after the outbreak of the wars between Russia and Ukraine and between Israel and Palestine. It seems to me that we remain blind to much of the driving force behind these troubling planetary processes if we fail to recognize the conflicting impact of the invisible value systems of the symbols that underpin and sustain them, the symbols of civilization and barbarism. A popular hypothesis is the appearance of barbarians during the Iron Age and the subsequent conquest of civilizations by barbarism through terror. With fire and sword, or rather, on horseback and with an iron sword, after which there was an era of tyranny and of devastating wars. A dark, gloomy era, or as I call Hesiod, an Iron Age, opposed to the mythical, golden age, of prosperity and prosperity, of the bread-eating people, that is, of the farmers. We have both legendary and archaeological evidence that this actually happened in the cultural area of southeastern Europe between the copper, bronze, and iron ages and maybe it will be repeated in a new way in the 21st century. Recently, I happened to read two remarkable books, unfortunately all more current, concerning the problem of civilization and barbarism, one scientific and one artistic. Fear of the Barbarians by Tsvetan Todorov and Waiting for the Barbarians by Kutsi. The imaginary discussion with the authors that took place in my mind inspired me to present my thoughts in a reasoned manner on this issue which seems to me to be original and essential. In short, the thesis I defend is that barbarism is not a pre-modern savagery, but is essentially a segment of civilizations in general. It not only directly derives from the civilized state-organized literary cultures. The civilization-barbarism dichotomy represents a single self-sustaining symbolic system of two value poles that mutually justify and drive each other. In an already emerging age of global barbarism, emanating from all the previous great civilizational traditions, Confucian, Buddhist, Hindu, Islamic, Judaic, and Christian and scientific, I find it timely to draw a more detailed and dynamic picture of the barbarians' kinship with of civilization and of barbarism with civilization under the question mark. It is possible to find a constructive or at least non-self-destructive point of reconciliation between these two interdependent trends in our human development how and why barbarism originates from civilization and especially important what does the barbarism of mind type civilization consist of including at the value symbolic level these are the problems, are the goals of this text. My brief understanding of symbols and symbol systems approaches the exposition in the works of Levi Strauss, Lacken, and especially Jung. In other words, symbols are equivalent to the language with which you communicate with yourself, with others, and with the world, and with the concepts, representations, thoughts, and feelings with which we give value or anti-value significance to what is imagined and what is observed in reality. Only a small part of these symbols the emblems are unambiguously defined as to what exactly they mean. Most are ambiguous and create a symphony, and often a polyphony, of interwoven available or potentially possible meanings. Especially significant for our present and future are already symbols that Jung defines as living, because they have a strong impact on human beings and societies, including on the organism and behavior. They can get your adrenaline pumping, your knees to buckle and your hands to shake. They can evoke active and purposeful behavior, as well as a desire to embody them in ourselves, in our lives, in our identities and in our morals. These feeling symbols and ideal symbols represent self-sustaining systems of mutually exclusive contradictions and balances between them for example love, hate, forgiveness, or mother, father, child, or concept, idea, ideal. One of these symbolic systems, significantly younger than the armed ones, is the mutually reinforcing dichotomy civilization barbarism dignity. It rests on a whole constellation of connected symbolic images, among which the important such influencers present as wallship homeland, concepts, ideas, ideals, individualism, thought, alienation, reading, writing, literariness, integrity, robbery, statehood, wealth protection degradation, machine nature healing, benefit efficiency suicide, panacea Pandora split. The names of these value symbol systems, as well as the connections between them, can be other. 
They are not permanently fixed, but soft. They come from the creative imagination and are subject to change and multiple interpretations. They are often dreams, plans and projects for future behavior in the process of implementation. This extraordinary, incompletely realized essence of theirs makes them not unreal, but somewhat superreal and dreamy, and somewhat actually realized, embodied in the identity of our ideas and dreams in an unfinished process of becoming, and this gives them a special power of impact on the human behavior and life motivation at the level of individuals, groups, and communities. Barbarism of Civilizations Part 1. The First Robot, The Mechanical Doll Pandora How many times separate us I am a person and you are a doll? Dimitar Voev it is remarkable how some of the most influential symbols of civilization and barbarism since ancient times seem to have the character of Cassiandrian, prophecies about the future development of civilizations after millennia. It is as if their first appearance also draws a path a channel for the development and for the catastrophe of each of the great civilizational traditions. This is also the case with the ancient literary masterpieces of the European Southeast those of Homer, Hesiod and Plato which set the course not only for the European type of fiction and scientific literature, but also for the modern technocratic European civilization, which drastically reshaped our planet in an unprecedented way in recent centuries. In this regard, the myth of the mechanical clay doll Pandora, presented by the farmer poet Hesiod of Boeotia in the oldest European author's fiction book, Acts and Days, is indicative in this regard. According to Hesiod's poetic interpretation of the myth of the misfortunes of civilizing humanity, all the worst in the world of city-state, inventive production, bread-eating, societies jumped out of the box, or rather the ceramic jar, which Zeus gave to the titan Epimetheus, brother co-ruler of Prometheus, and his subjects the humans, complete with an enticingly beautiful clay tower machine Pandora. By order of the Aegis Holder, she was involved, sculpted and assembled by Hephaestus as a wonderful beautiful idol ex machina, as an artificial but seductive mechanical robot, secretly programmed with a single task to open the cauldron of evils for humans. The well-known lame god by the will of Zeus sculpted. A clay figure in an instant, like a maiden shy. And in her breast the herald Hermes, slayer of Argos. Cunning words and more lies, and a thieving nature. Invested by the will of Zeus the thunderer terrible, and speech. Hermes gave her a chevron, and called her Pandora. They gave her a gift trouble for the bread-eating human race. Hesiod, Acts and Days In the modern Western European world, the fallacy is still popular today, according to which Pandora is presented as a symbol of the stupid and curious woman who, due to her intemperance, caused harm to her husband, and also darkened the future of the entire human race. This popular, macho, story, stigmatizing the female sex, actually has little to do with the myth retold by Hesiod. According to the original text, Pandora is simply a machine a mechanical doll a deceptive simulation of a living being, purposefully and deliberately programmed to deceive with artificial words and surrogate pseudo-intelligence. The mean gift of Zeus is actually the robot Pandora itself, donated by the Olympians complete with its accessory the Jar of Evils. According to the text of Acts and Days, it appears that Pandora is not a woman at all at first, but a kind of robot machine, or like the Trojan horse it is a clay doll, specially created by the gods with a single purpose, to harm people both men and women, and their leaders the titans. In this case, the one deceived with the gift doll is not a woman, but a man Epimetheus. And he, besides not being a woman, but a man, is also not a man at all but a titan from the old gods, brother of Prometheus. Therefore, according to the text, it appears that the gods are deceiving each other, and the victims are humans. Humans have no part in the gods' misanthropic misdeeds either men nor women, and they are all innocent victims. This is claimed in Hesiod's original text. The Pandora doll itself which in essence is neither a woman nor a person at all, but a mechanical object, as well as Pandora's box or more precisely, a jar, itself is a mechanic, specially made and programmed to release diseases. Therefore, evil was released into the world not by a woman, but by a robot machine. The trickster Pandora, the first European robot machine, 
intentionally enchants with her mechanical lying speech and artificial intelligence. In the invisible superworld of symbols of our mentality, even today this first proto-machine robot of Southeast European and Asia Minor mythology continues to be a living symbol of the machine's soullessness of the increasingly advanced modern, artificial civilizations, with their Frankensteinian inventions and technologies exalted as idols requiring human sacrifice. With their gullible cult of the artificial, the apparent, and the surrogate, with their infantile dazzle by things, especially mechanical toys, with their frivolous, short-sighted, titanic rulers, who by reason of their mental short-sightedness, inflict upon their subjects and their descendants cruel calamities and misfortunes in future ages, with their byzantinely refined yet barbarically perfidious manners, combining manipulative deception with self-inflicted self-delusion. The artificial in art, the magic of the clay doll come to life, be it Calcio, Golem, Pandora, Emperor Qin Shu Huang's terracotta army or Dr. Victor Frank's monster, leads the new civilizing man to idolatry before puppetry before clay idols, and demeaning us to the results of our own inventions as supposed all-saving panaceas is at the root of the black magic of civilized barbarism. Savage superstitious idolatry in front of artificial products of civilization has a specific psychic dehumanizing effect caused by personal immaturity, objectifying personal immaturity, but also leading to the reproduction of personal immaturity, including on a mass scale, and from there to civilizational imbalances. Bequeathed to us since our Neolithic ancestors, the idolatrous practice of self-humiliation in front of clay figures in front of our own artificial creations also reflects the immaturity of entire civilizations, which in their public life still have the character of sick from idolatry, socio-cultural systems. Already in the Neolithic period in the Eurasian Asia Minor Fertile Crescent, increasingly innovative pottery technologies led to a boom, not only in prosperity and birth rates but also in inventions that humanity had not been able to realize or imagine until that moment, and in the most fantastic dreams, the fermentation vessels of wine and beer, the adobe house, the adobe city, the bread pan, the furnace for melting metal and for firing terracotta and porcelain, the clay books collected and classified in adobe repositories libraries such as the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal founded in Babylon. For a long time, the panacea of the civilized the material called to miraculously solve all possible crises and problems of the community this is clay both in a literal and figurative symbolic sense, as a prototype of everything artificial, which man will materialize in his subsequent civilizational development. Clay is the magic of bringing the artificial to life, on which everything increasingly depends life, survival, sustenance, wealth and greed and insatiability. On a symbolic level, Clay can easily be seen in such a perspective in myths as a living symbol for the hubris of creative ingenuity. It is enough to recall the gluttony of the animated clay Adam, the Jewish tale of the all-devouring animated clay idol Golem, and the analogous of Bulgarian tale about the animated clay Calcho, about the evilness of the animated clay doll Pandora. Perhaps there is a connection between the fact that the first written texts appeared on clay tablets, and that it is these very oldest books that refer to clay as the material from which man himself is made. And probably because of their adobe origins, the civilizations of the literacy often resemble a colossus with feet of clay, threatened at any moment to collapse under its own weight, as Jesus says to Pontius Pilate in Kazitsakis novel The Last Temptation. Today's European civilizing and socializing conformism, based on a barbaric simplification of mentality, in its mental foundation, is directly inherited from our Neolithic Southeast European ancestors from the pro-civilization of clay. In essence, he follows and popularizes the same idolatrous way of thinking of the potter inventor, deifying his own artificial creation. Moreover, his value and worldview model is not only characteristic of engineering minds, inclined to treat living reality as an artificial machine that can be disassembled and assembled, but is largely universal for the European type of mental barbarism of civilization. In this regard, the malevolent deceitfulness of the idol doll is embodied in a variety of modern artifacts of civilizational progress. For example, the economy, today's holy cow, of the Euro-civilizers, a complex, 
unfathomable and unpredictable economic subsystem of civilizations in itself within the social prestige status quo of the conformists is not seen as an intertwining of production activities and commerce with the entire super-ecosystem of culture and nature, and as an idol panacea, as a clay idol, as an almost magical, mantra, a single meaning and one-dimensional emblem of the good, and the valuable. The economic sphere of our civilizations is represented in the mass consciousness not as an indivisible set of real human actions, but as a supreme being descended from above, similar to Deus et Machina in the ancient theater and Lettre Supreme from the time of the French Revolution, as a deity and idol, as our mother and father on the model of the communist party mother nursery. At the same time, other spheres related to the economy social, political, natural and geographical, morals, upbringing, education are excluded from the economic reasoning about reality, as if they do not exist at all. Since it is implied that only and only the holy economy is indisputably good and is the only possible good, then this magical invention panacea. Therefore, anything that does not have financial metrics, GDP and surplus value is somehow evil, bad, or insignificant. If he still has humane feelings, or at least an empathic imagination, the not a man, but an economist, idolater of financial growth, thinking as he does, could also get involved in his own value judgments about his artificial idol in the face of the economy, because the unpleasant aftertaste of the moral consequences of some financially profitable phenomena such as wars, the killing of pregnant women, babies and children, the torture of people, the enslavement, and genocide of entire nations or classes. In order to faithfully and enthusiastically serve the supreme deities of the world markets, he has to divide himself into a human and a non-human, economic, part. These two halves are put away in different cabinets of his mind, so that it is certain that they will never have any connection with each other. When he opens his one mental drawer, he will speak to us as a man broken by the starving babies and the crippled children left without legs by the bombings. Then he will close this mental drawer and open the other one to reason about how economically profitable and justified military conflicts and the enslavement of the third world are, of course, from the idolatrous, master-servant, point of view, the economic compartment in his mind is more likely to be perceived as more fulfilling than the other that is human, because the human is guided by moral feelings and disturbing and unpleasant ones and the financial one from an idol built from pure mathematics the new, clay, of the digitized electronic age i.e. of a supreme civilizational creation, valued as an almost divine gift, transcending the meaning of the lives of individuals, of their joys, pains, pains, sufferings or cruel fates inflicted by their fellows. It will not be pleasant if we admit that in most cases we think barbarically bowed before our idols like man. Not a man, but an economist. Whatever arguments we answer him with, it is very likely that they will turn out to be similar to his idolatrous reasoning schemes, only with a different evaluative symbolism. For example, if as clay dolls divine gifts we accept not the economy, but instead no less hollow declamatory values idols for the sanctity of humanity and empathy, then will we not find ourselves in the role of not a man, but a humanist. The proclaimed surrogate humanism has not infrequently turned out to be another fraudulent, Pandora, fueled by a lie-spewing propaganda machine, simulating vitality and humanity, which in the end turns out to be a cover for a purposeful program of misanthropy and human destruction. In its deceptive simulated pseudo-vibrancy, creating an illusion of potency and vitality, every tyrannical civilization actually hides a powerlessness sculpted by surrogacy and artificiality. Its insidiously disguised unforgiving barbarism gives refined civilization the qualities of an imitation product, mechanically crafted by soulless ceremonialism, characteristic even of today's technocracy. The robotic, machine-operated, artificiality army is a product of high societies, in every civilizational tradition known to us throughout history especially for those close to autocrats. In this regard, the heirs of the former European palace intrigues the modern, Eurocrats, by their lifelessness simulating life and power, by their empty talk, vanity and artful artificiality inspire a sense of illusion of life, similar to that which the terracotta army from the tomb of the first Chinese emperor suggests. In its current, 
Hypermodern. Modification. The army of artificiality is also sculpted from the clay of surrogate, simulacrums, pseudomoral amorality, pseudo-rational irrationality, pseudo-value cynicism, pseudo-principled opportunism and pseudo-personalized conformity all frozen to guard like clay scarecrows the tomb of the mentioned European empires. The terracotta souls, words, and deceptively human-like faces once fabricated in their workshops have dominated public communications since the sunset of European imperial barbarism. The hyper-technologized modern nanomagic of surrogates and simulacrums enters our public life today as fake news but not only as the outright fake news from slanderous, troll, organizations, but also as the official propaganda fake. We can also recognize them as Pandora's fake smile on the pseudo-faces of pseudo-public pseudo-personalities. Pandora's deception is multiplied in our communication channels in a real multimedia world empire of surrogates with fake smiles and billions and billions of posters, advertisements, series, films, photos and posts, in the boom of fake laughs, fake tearful dramas, fake values, fake feelings, fake reason, fake mind and false communication behind which hides a catastrophically dehumanizing elementarization, a simplification and dulling of morals, feelings, and the mind. After September 11, 2001, Svetin Todorov wrote his work, Fear of the Barbarians, with the aim of demolishing all the foundations of a barbarically dangerous propaganda text Huntington's on the clash of civilizations. Todorov approaches theses about good and bad civilizational models, Radically, he rejects the importance of different civilizational traditions and refuses to define them in any other way than one it is civilized to recognize those who are different from you as human beings like you with the same right to develop and exist under the sun, and it is barbaric to treat others as if they were objects of exploitation and not to recognize them as full living beings. Thus, in Shame on the Barbarians, Svetin Todorov recognizes only one aspect of the French word, civilization the universal human plan. Any civilization can reach civilization, but civility is a personal quality of a particular individual, not a characteristic of society. The same applies to barbarism. There are no barbaric peoples, societies, and cultures. Todorov argues there are barbaric manners of specific human beings in every possible society and tradition, whether complex and centuries old, young and simplistic, urban or rural, tribal or state, literary or oral and regardless of what great civilizing examples it has had or has in the past and in the present. Even the most refined civilized person is capable of barbaric actions, barbaric thinking, barbaric emotionality and barbaric treatment of others. And vice versa even the most primitive savage is capable of inner civility or cultivation in terms of his perception of the world, and of himself, and of his relation to others and to otherness. Fear of barbarians makes us barbarians. And every single act of civilization or cultivation of the personality creates a model for the planetary civilization universalistic, all human, beyond and above the particularities of the specific civilizational models and their cultural traditions. In this sense, the translation of the term civilization used by Todorov and Bulgarian would be precisely civilization, and not civilization or civilizations, because the latter is misleading. Svetin Todorov's text is difficult to criticize intelligently and in good faith, as it is clear that it has been considered and checked by the author many times with complete dedication and great passion. And yet it should not be overlooked that in order to reach civilization as a personal quality, the individual develops in a certain cultural and civilizational tradition and assimilates its patterns and concepts, and ideas and ideals, as his own. The paradoxical combination of civilization and barbarism in the systems of literary thinking, literary communication and statehood as a social and cultural macrosystem is possible because, as far as civilizations are complex socio-cultural organisms, they are in essence contradictory, paradoxical balances of incompatibilities, both reconciled and irreconcilable. They are the result of a civilizational dynamism that consists in the attempts, often unsuccessful, to hold and maintain the fragile balance of harmony between the polarities that make them up. Thus, for example, civilized communication becomes possible thanks to estrangement. Namely, estrangement is one of the reasons for this savage, 
of the civilized and for the barbarization of his behavior. By virtue of such a systemic paradox, universal literary literacy today paradoxically leads to phenomena of functional illiteracy, of mass ignorance semi knowledge. In the same contradictory way, hyperindividualism becomes possible only in the presence of an institutionalized collective, but it is the selfishness of the individualist that breaks down the resistance of the collective goods that made his selfishness possible. In dynamic terms, statehood as a civilizing political system can also be seen as a difficult-to-match balance of private and public interests, regulated by public communications. But at the same time, civilization is in principle possible as a concept only in combination with barbarism. Moreover, it itself breeds barbarism and greatly facilitates the barbarization of societies. Already several thousand years ago, the ideas of public interest and social justice shaped civilized man. Making a living through agriculture, animal husbandry, trade and handicrafts built him a long-term thinking, also aimed at future generations. Politic and imperial trade and incessant wars of conquest connected with colonial expansion also lead to the dream of world power over all nationalities, which in turn led to the idea of a single world empire, a superstate that subjugated the earth on three continents, in Asia, in Africa, and in Europe. This is how the aspiration towards globalism and imperialism was born. Along with this, for the first time in human history, the phenomenon of unheard of wealth and uncountable capitals of societies appeared. And precisely at this moment, during the Iron Age, the main actor of the elementalization of the human mind in civilized societies appears on the historical stage the civilizing barbarian, who decides to conquer and appropriate the accumulated wealth of the city for himself personally, by means of the simplest brute force or elementary tricks, lies, deceptions, and intrigues. To be a barbarian is to be an uncivilized person in a civilized environment. Savages who live in tribal, bookless societies are not barbarians, per se. Until they come into contact with the city, until they enter through the gates in the city walls, they are simply savages, living in the wild childhood of humanity, humanized by language, feelings, and folklore, but still close to the animal way of life, hunting and gathering. For a savage to become a barbarian, he must be brought into contact with civilization, touched by it, compared to it, interpreted by it, and tempted by it. With the development of agricultural civilization, the game hunters, now unnecessary to agricultural culture, the former heroes of the tribe, lost their social and cultural prestige and self-esteem, and their crude efficient minds became the object of ridicule for the refined cultivated intellects of the inventors of the plow and of wine, of bread and the forge, of trade and navigation of letters and textiles, of state institutions and the cultivation of plants and animals, of earthenware and architecture, of astrology and money, of geometry and the first wooden machines and mechanisms, of arithmetic and of rural and urban self-government. Just such a dramatic story about the clash of the savage with the urban civilization, and specifically with an aristocrat brought up in urban manners, is told in our first known fiction book the Sumerian legend about the civilized ruler of the city of Uar King Gilgamesh and about the wild hero from the forest Enkidu. In Mesopotamian myth, Enkidu was killed in the service of the civilized King Gilgamesh, and his ghost cursed the cities and urban customs. In real history, however, in the Iron Age, the barbarian, nomad and warrior, returns to the city again, but this time as a conqueror and as a winner not the philosophizing and hesitant Gilgamesh because of his intellect, but wild, intellectually limited, but strong, unforgiving and rough warriors like Enkidu became kings of the world's first over-expanding and all-enslavement empires. How did human reason evolve in the midst of barbaric monarchical despotism? In these conditions, the complex thinking mind of women is unbearably suffocated, like an animal in a cage. Clever women terrified, and still terrorize barbarian despots. Preferable for marriage were definitely mentally disabled women who passed on these qualities, biologically and culturally, to their female offspring. Nor have ruling tyrants ever liked men who display too much intelligence. Reasonable men had to refrain from displaying intelligence and flattering those in power, turning into silent stoics or jesters, mimicking in order to survive. Remember, for example, Petronius from Sinkowitz's novel Quo Vadis. 
Thus, the image of the smart man becomes the image of the silent fish, the pitiful jester, or the vile intriguer and schemer. But even in this degraded form thinking is not honorable. It is preferable to give up one's own judgments if one aspires to social advancement to adopt the subservient culture of the lackey who does not think but mechanically executes the superior's orders. What is characteristic of the alienated intelligent person today was probably also characteristic of the first ancient intelligentsia they were deeply cultivated people, which, on the one hand, leads to kindness and peacefulness, and on the other hand, to the ability to see the world and your fellows from different points of view, and thus gain wisdom, i.e. to give up unequivocal judgments about good and evil, and from there to be inclined to give way, to give rights to others, and often to fall into a state of doubt, uncertainty, and hesitation. Thus, in the end, the mentally and culturally more developed become victims, slaves, jesters or lackeys, servants and loyal subjects of the brute tyrants, of the unforgiving and merciless fools. Paradoxically, but a fact, outside the wild natural environment and the conditions of statehood mental limitation and elementariness prove to be more effective than complex thinking, resourcefulness, innovation and intellect, especially when barbarians also have the inventions through which civilization was created. Thus, the state civilizations of the polis this complicated and inventive, but therefore disjointed and vacillating, political and economic culturally alienating urban environment has become easy prey for conquest by the barbarism of the mind. And the era of the efficiency of the mentally and spiritually elementary, served by cunning, refined civilized and inventive intelligentsia, the monarchical power was transformed into a perverted complicated, and subservient to the master, state administration of intriguers and lackeys, proficient in writing. And along with to the consolidation of the tyrannical type of socio-political system the reign of the barbarian as a simple and straightforward master of civilized scoundrels. The new type of state-organized conquering armies transformed the former heroes, from hunters of game to hunters of gold and riches and of soul and unlimited power over many peoples, cities and civilizations. Thus began the era of the destruction of Troy and the reign of the effective and elementary brute force of the male warlike and violent world of patriarchal despotism, of the one-man and uncontrolled tyranny of arrogant and unscrupulous monarchs, of barbarian conquerors such as the Mycenaean king Agamemnon. No story reveals more convincingly and more profoundly than the Southeast European Homeric Iliad this process in the European type of victory of the barbaric and elementary over the complex and cultivated. A characteristic of total subjugation is annihilation of man, nihilization, dehumanization, amoralism, conformism, impersonality, mechanicalness following inertia, mechanicalness, nothingness, destitution, self-destruction. The reason for voluntary self-effacement is the fear of one's own will and the refusal to assume the accompanying responsibility it is transferred to others. Fleeing from freedom Delegating all personal responsibility to someone else to take it without a trace can easily lead to conformity, impersonality, soullessness, inhumanity and mechanicalness man becomes a machine. This process of depersonalization the mechanization of the footman follows a logic of its own and can end in an extreme. The world of the servant mental, social and cultural dissolves loses clear forms and outlines turns into an amorphous mass back into the primal formless mud, liquefied clay. Unfortunately, the civilized barbaric elementalization of the European type of inventive pragmatic thinking, combined with pirate-type behavior, covers dangerously wide areas, destroying or sickening the hyper-complex systems of life, of our bodies, of our psyches and of our societies and cultures. The living symbols of the man-robot, similar to the mechanical clay Pandora doll, are becoming more and more archetypal for our modern collective psyche which has modified the Neolithic idolatrous, clay culture, into a machine culture, in which the omnipresent adobe artificial golem is now also electronic planetary-wide artificial intelligence. The anxiety of the ideas of the construction and industrial production of hybrid organism machines also became exemplary of the modern modification of European civilizational barbarism. We can easily find the animated machine and the mechanized man in the power of symbols from modern literature and cinema to laboratory bioengineering experiments in the style of Mary Shelley's Victor Frankenstein's Monster or Darth Vader's Man Machine George Lucas. 
Huxley's Brave New World, and Wachowski's Matrix, at the dawn of the 21st century are already being built on Earth with the help of nanotechnological, computer, genetic, biological, mental, social, and cultural engineering. Actual cases of bio, psycho, and social engineering sometimes surpass the coldness of the mind, and the Welsh Martians, and the perversity of the experiments even the most disturbing images of the human imagination in the style of Frankenstein, or the island of Dr. Moreau. Such is the case, for example, of the failed experiment to construct a genetically modified goat-spider hybrid for use in the textile industry. The idea of a goat producing cobwebs instead of milk is morally frightening, a testament to the typically European civilizing barbaric perverse drive for efficiency. Whether it is communism, fascism, Marxism, anarchism, racism, Nazism and nationalism, scientism, the idolaters of technical progress, the technocratic machinery of eurocrats, and serious scientists, or today's neo-capitalist covert propaganda of multinational corporations, efficiency requirements are a major symptom of the European civilizational barbaric type of utilitarian thinking which is characterized by short-sightedness regarding the organic indivisible integrity of the human and natural world and indifference to the soul and spiritual dimensions of man. The utilitarian, barbarically elementary thinking that characterizes our European civilizations probably developed over centuries from our ancient southeastern European ancestors, the inventors of efficient exploitation agriculture, animal husbandry, metallurgy, slavery, crafts, trade, finance and administration. And even today it seems is an unwritten mandatory requirement for the prestige and self-esteem of the modern European as well. And the banal evil of the self-inflicted false blindness of mind and soul which the efficient efficient simplistic thinking only of the immediate benefits produces may lead to a barbarism of the civilized mind with more dangerous consequences for our future than we shall find in which and to have been outright malice. The barbarism of the mind, utilitarian thinking. Our civilized upbringing in barbaric, piecemeal, thinking, short term, without nuance and without complex context, always in two oppositions, without sense and without interest in the multiplicity, indeterminacy and hypercomplexity of our world, largely stems from the unconditional demand for efficiency at any cost in today's generally accepted, European, socio cultural model. The reason we think elementary and fragmented perhaps also stems from the standards of the logic of opposition, the so-called non-contradiction, of monocentralism, of focusing on objects, separate elements, and not on the connections between them, generally accepted in our culture. Neglecting their structure and functions, we consider the quantity of objects, not the qualitative level of their meaning and essence in a complete but often excessive cynical utilitarian pragmatism seriously limits people's interaction with the world and reduces thinking to potentially dangerous elementary logical models. Thus, our civilized thinking becomes elementary barbaric, which means somewhat methodical and classifying, but also abstracted from empiricism in its connected entirety, from experience, and ultimately from reality itself. The total formalization of science, where it is not the content and quality that matters, but the quantity of scientific publications and their positioning in pseudo-prestigious databases illuminates only one side of the question of why the most complex reality we know the human one is often analyzed in the most elementary and astonishingly simplistic way possible precisely by civilized minds. From the point of view of the social prestige of the intelligentsia, the situation is aggravated by the fact that complex thought is not politically correct, it is uncomfortable and embarrassing. No political ideological clique would welcome it, and sponsors from economic lobbies would hardly give funds for its popularization. And the lackey and servile nature of the humanities and social sciences fosters a surprisingly elementary, one-dimensional, black and white way of thinking. The inadequacy of utilitarian thinking for complex reality can be traced in several aspects. Hypersimplification, oversimplification, elementalization, reducing complex wholes to their separate constituent elements. Fragmentation, viewing the interconnected artifacts and phenomena as completely separate from each other, as if they were things arranged in separate drawers. Manichaean aporia, 
the reduction of all complex reality to only two irreconcilably opposed forces or objects, without indicating their combining, balancing and reconciling quality. Monism and or monocentrism, the reduction of all the immeasurable diversity of life to a single central concept, phenomenon or judgment. Formalism, exclusion of interest in the essential, substantive and qualitative characteristics of the observed reality, as if they did not exist at all, analysis based only on quantitative and formal criteria. Amorphousness, meaninglessness and presentation of the various phenomena as if they have no meaning and no value, in the absence of criteria and merging of all reasoning into an idealist and senseless mess. Unfortunately, barbarically simplistic civilized thinking about complex phenomena is not harmless, as it very often leads to ill-considered and malicious actions, some of which can turn out to be fatal for the human world. In its extreme forms, utilitarian thinking increasingly resembles a categorical amoral imperative of utility, opposed to Kant's categorical moral imperative of conscience, honesty, justice, and conscience. If the moral imperative innate in every human being, in the words of Immanuel Kant, states that man is not a means but an end, then the imperative of obligatory usefulness, when it becomes immoral, seems to begin to say just the opposite. Man is not goal and a means instrument to achieve benefit, benefit, effectiveness, efficiency. Of course, utility and benefits are absolutely necessary for every human being and for every social formation. But this judgment makes sense only if there are human beings, i.e. only if human qualities are paramount, including, useless, human qualities such as a sense of humor, the ability to dream, fantasize, sing in the shower, enjoy a small animal, be sad or laugh for no apparent reason. The meaning of benefits for the person is possible only if the emphasis falls first on the goal of the person, and then on the means the benefits, i.e. if the realization of the potential of useful and apparently useless human qualities precedes any other possible goal or task, including the demands of short-term, and often short-sighted, utility. In an inverted logic where benefits are the goal and man is the means to them, the imperative of benefits to man becomes meaningless and irrational. In its most elementary dimension, utilitarian thinking can resemble the Beganev calculation of how to hit the Kelepir, i.e. how to get personal benefit from everything and everyone, but in fact it can be much more complicated. Utilitarian consciousness does not necessarily have to be self-centered. It can also aim for altruistic benefits not for the individual, but for the collective and the community. The questions that would arise from complex thinking in this case are not whether the utility is necessary and should be ignored, why it is not only unconditionally necessary but also unavoidable, but to whom is the utility, is it short-term or long-term, what is the human meaning of it, what is the price to be paid for the usefulness and is it really worth paying in human terms, and unintended consequences of a particular benefit. The unwritten but often unconditional European civilizational imperative for utilitarian thinking, which our Balkan inventor ancestors created back in antiquity, demands from human beings mandatory efficiency and effectiveness, at all costs. But what is efficiency and effectiveness? What non-obvious psychic symbolic and soulful and spiritual subtexts lie behind these two concepts? And why and to whom is it necessary in all cases that they should be binding and obligatory? Effectiveness means producing an effect, i.e. a visible change through impact. But not in all cases the changes are visible, especially when they manifest themselves in the long term, far from in all cases they are achieved through a one-way and simple impact, and not in all cases they are necessary at all there are many situations in which they are rather undesirable. Efficacy is the requirement that the effects of an impact be beneficial, long-term and lasting. However, the complexity of reality suggests that no effect can be entirely and solely beneficial, and will necessarily lead to negative and useless consequences. In such a case, in the first place, the question must be asked whether the negatives of a given efficiency would be acceptable both in a rational and utilitarian, as well as in an overall human plan. And long-term durability, or sustainability, is never achieved by a few innumerable effects or patterns of action but by countless complex factors persistent over time, some of which are imperceptible or barely noticeable and, at first glance, 
to more short-sighted minds might they could also appear to be completely useless, ineffective, and inefficient. Since effectiveness and efficiency are reduced to the changes brought about by a certain effect, they predestined to be realized mainly by means of the simplest possible command-type communication and do not imply either dialogue or communion, complex communication with a cultural context that creates communities between people. In this sense, becoming mostly or entirely effective and efficient, a person loses a large part of the forms of communication that humanize him, and therefore unexpectedly easily can also slip into alienation and inhumanity into the characterlessness and impersonality of the legions that feed the banality of evil, degradation, irresponsibility and nothingness. At the same time, the alienation and degradation of the utilitarian-minded efficient and effective civilized European people often leads them to a more barbaric irrational fear including a fear of life that fosters in them consciously or unconsciously. Biophobia, terror and hatred of life and all living things, i.e. constantly moving, changing, diverse and unpredictable. Anthropophobia, horror and hatred of human beings and their humanizing qualities, especially their useless dimensions such as aimless dreaming, moral or aesthetic ideals, senseless imagination, silly fantasies, laughter, gratuitous sadness or the enthusiastic joy of existence. Paranoia, painful suspicion, disgust and fear of any reality external to the individual which is necessarily perceived as hostile, hostile and threatening to the goals and interests of the individual concerned. While the understandable and largely, natural, in the ape primate sense, master-servant, symbiotic relationship between humanitarian thought and the powerful of the day is hardly a sufficient explanation for the rudimentary nature of thinking about the most complex human realities, which characterizes not only the sciences, but also the everyday level of thinking and communication. What does it consist of and is there a conciliatory balance that would allow these two forces in it barbarism and civilization to reach a truce and not destroy each other? Are there also trends that could help the individual and the societies to get out of the suicidal stage of puberty of humanity, in which we find ourselves in the path of our development so far? Imagine people in some kind of underground cave-like dwelling that has an open and long gap for light all around the cave. Let people live in it from childhood with fetters so placed on their feet and necks that when they are here they see only what is in front of them, without being able to turn their heads because of the fetters. Let light come to them from a fire burning from above and far behind them, and, imagine a wall erected, as conjurers erect a barrier in front of the spectators, on which they show their tricks. Imagine by that wall people carrying various things, protruding above the wall, statues of people and figures of animals made of stone and wood in different ways. They are similar to us, I answered, do you think that these prisoners, both in themselves and among themselves, saw anything other than shadows that fall from the fiery glow on the opposite wall of the cave in front of them? Plato In the first cities of the oldest yet discovered civilization of ancient farmers in Anatolia, 7500 BC, the inhabitants lived in rooms similar to beehives. The whole city had resembled a single huge common mud house, with hundreds of rooms in it connected by corridors with an open-air exit only to the terraces on the roofs, and to the central circle surrounded by the wall of dwellings, which was something like inner courtyard. The brick walls protected the ancient Anatolian huts from adverse climatic conditions, from cold and heat, from drought and from rain and moisture, from pests and from enemies, but practically isolated them from the natural environment. Their rooms, although connected by common corridors, separated the families from each other as if each of them lived alone in their own cave. Thus, the family has become an independent, isolated world, literally a cell of society. No one has access to your room, knows what goes on behind its walls and cannot interfere in your private world. Thus, the ties between family members became the only source of immediate communication with an emotional, supervaluable and sensual charge for the first citizens. In this way, contacts with the rest of the clans of the tribe are naturally transformed into superficial, mediated, and sporadic. This situation is also clearly visible in the later civilizations of the Western Anatolians, for example, 
in the description of the Trojan families of Hector, Paris, Priam and Cassandra in Homer's Iliad. Claude Levi Strauss ingeniously defines literary civilizations as cold cultures. Communication in them is alienated and mediated, therefore the epithet, cold, is appropriate from the point of view of the emotional sensual coldness in the relationships of civilizing people, who spend most of the day closed and isolated from others in their private property. At the individual level, the wall is a prerequisite both for alienation from others and for the development of individualism in human personalities. Alienation individualism is expressed in new indirect communication techniques of mediated expression through signs. The wall is a dual symbol of the honey and the sting of civilization. On the one hand, it gives protection to the state and to the individual, protection from the wild and the dangerous, from the barbarians and from the enemies, including from the barbarism and from the crime that lurks in the savage depths of the human psyche. On the other hand, the wall of civilization alienates the state-organized society from the balances in nature, including from everything natural and healthy, breaks man's ties with his fellow men and with the world and turns him into a prisoner isolated in himself, protected, but and hopelessly locked behind the walls of the intellect. To be continued.